All right, so this is probably why most of you came today. You want to know how to reduce the dose to your patients and how to reduce the dose to yourselves. Uh, the other stuff is interesting, but you know we don't have that much control over it. It's the way the machines are made and how they're used. But reducing patient dose is important um, for all of us, and there certainly is much more public concern about dose than there has been in the past um, with all the things that have been going on with CT recently. So, ALARA. ALARA is a concept that's been used for many, many years, and it's something that we teach all uh, radiology, radiology residents and um, radiology students, and that is a, the idea or the principle that we try to keep the dose as low as reasonably achievable for ourselves and for our patients. And so there's lots of methods that you can do to reduce dose, um, certainly. And, uh, and, and you're, it's kind of an ethical dilemma, not dilemma, but how you approach dose. And you'll work with some people who believe in controlling dose and other people who really don't care about dose. And so depending upon what type of uh, technologist or uh, physician, that you're working with. Um, some people are what we call lead-footed. They're stepping on the pedal constantly, and other people are very conscientious about stepping on the pedal and exposing the patient to radiation. They're, you know, they use shielding, they collimate, they do all of these things to try to reduce the dose as much as possible. Part of it's familiar, how familiar you are with the procedures and that sort of thing. Over time, we tend to get more familiar and maybe not as, as um, uh, careful about how we expose patients, but certainly it's something we always want to be mindful of for ourselves and for our patients. So dose to patients and the frequency of examinations is increasing um, over time, and they estimate that the frequency of radiologic examinations increases about 10% per year per age group. And nowhere is this more true than in CT. CT, the number of uh, CT exams that were per performed 10 years ago are much, much higher now um, than they were back then. We certainly rely more upon um, x-rays for diagnosis than we did in the past. Uh, and in some cases, you may take x-rays because you're practicing defensive medicine. Maybe you don't think there's a fracture, but you're afraid if you don't take an x-ray and there turns out to be a fracture that you may have um, you know, a lawsuit as a result of it or something. Uh, a lot of it has to do with standard of practice. Um, if they're doing something as a standard of practice in your community, you're almost obligated to do that as well, whether you believe that it's necessary or not. But certainly, more people are depending upon um, diagnostic tools to make the diagnosis as opposed to the old-fashioned clinical evaluation of the patient. We went in and examined the patient, and um, and some of you may, there's little videos out on YouTube and things about, you know, insistence on getting a CT scan or that sort of thing, kind of funny things that you can listen to where the patient's never been examined. However, um, certainly the increase in exposure to the population is a concern um, to public health officials and to the FDA and others. And so uh, the late effects of radiation exposure are pretty much, if for diagnostic radiology, are pretty much unknown. Certainly can diagnostic x-rays cause cancer. We don't believe that they can, the amounts that we're giving, but if a person is exposed to enough radiation, certainly there's always a probability that that can be true. So what are some of the unnecessary exposures that you know maybe you used to do and you don't do anymore? They used to do mass screening for tuberculosis. That's not really done too much anymore. Uh, all hospital admissions used to get a chest x-ray for example, or they do examinations on patients. With uh, DRGs and reimbursement, a lot of this stuff has gone by the wayside simply because it's not paid for anymore. Pre-employment physicals, some uh, companies used to do back x-rays, lumbar spine x-rays for pre-employment, chest x-rays for pre-employment pre prior to. Um, periodic health examinations. Um, how many of you order routine x-rays for a health examination when you do a physical exam on someone? They don't yield that much if the patient's asymptomatic, right? Uh, screening for chest x-ray for lung cancer, that sort of thing. Um, for a while, there was a uh, tendency for people to go and self-order x-rays. They opened up CT. Do they have these in Texas where you can go and, and, and uh, self-refer, go and get a CT scan of your lungs? You pay the $300 and they'll scan your body. They'll do an abdomen scan. They'll do a heart scan to see if you have calcification. Well, in California, you can do that. You can go to these centers and pay out of pocket um, expenses to be scanned, and it has a, about a 15% um, positive rate. Um, whether it's false positive, sometimes if it's 
normal for that person. It may come up as abnormal, but and then they get further workup and that sort of thing. Plus, there's additional exposure to the patient. So most radiologists are against these standalone imaging centers. Um, we, we did have one in Santa Barbara for a period of time. It was owned by a cardiologist, and um, eventually it went out of business. But people can self-refer and get CT scans if they're concerned. Um, you know, there have been studies done if a smoker goes and gets a CT scan, they're motivated really to quit smoking because they're concerned about their health. So it, it can be a positive thing as well. The other thing is repeat examinations. Uh, with DR, we have fewer repeat examinations than we used to because you have such a wide range of exposure latitude. Most of the time when we repeat examinations for patients now, it's because of motion, they're moving, or the positioning's improper or something like that. But uh, repeat examinations aren't a huge thing. And then technique and positioning is also important. Using high KVP, low mass, certainly will reduce patient's dose as opposed to um, high mass and low KVP where the patient gets uh, higher exposure to radiation. So there's different things that we can do to reduce. So some of the uh, suggestions that we make as far as uh, reducing dose in fluoroscopy and um, for normal routine radiography is using a higher KVP technique. When you're doing fluoroscopy, most people use 90 KVP or greater. Why? So that they can use less MA. The higher the KVP, again, the more penetration you get through the patient and the density will be created by those photons striking the image receptor as opposed to using more photons. So when we use high KVP and low mass, um, we can give the patient a lower dose. But what, at what cost? It's usually the contrast. With, C, with um, fluoroscopy, contrast is not a real big deal, though, and why not? When you're doing fluoroscopy, you're usually using something, you're giving the patient something which is Contrast. You're giving them contrast media, which automatically enhances the contrast. So if you're giving them barium, you're giving them iodine, um, that's going to enhance the contrast so we can kind of uh, uh, give a higher KVP without worrying about our scale of contrast as much. And again, um, when we talked about DR, um, DR has a lower, that pulsed radiography has a lower dose associated with it. So if you're using pulsed progressive um, fluoroscopy, that's also the same as using a faster imaging system. CR is a faster imaging system compared to the film screen systems that we were using before. The other thing that you have to be consider is gonadal exposure. Um, a person in childbearing age, um, we, we're always concerned about gonadal exposure to them, and one of the best ways to prevent gonadal exposure is by collimating the beam properly. You know, collimating to the area that you're interested in. I always tell students, we never need to see a scrotum on an x-ray. <laughs> so if you're doing a lumbar spine and I can see the scrotum, I mean, there's, that, should be, that should be shielded, you should be collimating. And in women, it's much more difficult to, um, to, to collimate and to protect the ovaries. So if you're doing a hips on a woman, if you're doing a lumbar spine, if you're doing a pelvis, anything in that region, you're going to give them a high gonadal dose. Even a chest x-ray, you're going to get scattered radiation to the ovaries. So women are more susceptible as far as um, you know, being exposed to radiation. Um, the other thing about women is that we only have so many eggs. We're born with our eggs, right? Men can make all the sperm they want, any time they want. So women are limited in if your eggs get exposed to radiation, those are the eggs that can be fertilized later on, okay? So, and the older you are, of course, the older your eggs are. But uh, usually if you damage a sperm, a, a <coughs> sperm, it's not going to be the sperm that, you know, if you're producing millions of sperm, the one chasing its tail is not gonna be the one that Impregnates, impregnates the egg, right? But if I have, you know, 300 eggs and I happen to hatch one that's uh, mutated, then that will be a, that will be a, a genetic deformity. So um, we always teach you want to make sure that you shield your patients whenever possible, and that's from birth until they're no longer capable of reproduction. So for men. You're always capable of reproduction. As long as there's Viagra, you're, you're, you know, we're, you're good to go. Uh, but for women, you know, we all reach a certain age of menopause where we're no longer ovulating and we can no longer reproduce. So most women, after they've reached menopause, we don't worry as much about uh, gonadal exposure, although it's always good to shield regardless. So lead shielding is very important. We use it all the time, and you can use it on your patients, certainly any area of their body that they're not um, being exposed to radiation. Uh, I had a patient one time, she was 80 years old and we were doing standing knees on her. And so I was working with a student and so we put her up against the wall, Bucky, and stood her up on there and she was standing up there and then we walked back to make the exposure and we're collimated to her knees and she yells out at me, she goes, don't I get an apron? 
I was so embarrassed when I went back out. I said, well, how old are you? She says, 80. And I said, uh, and you have children? And she goes, yes, I have four children, and I have you know, 20 grandchildren, or whatever. Um, but her point was, you know, I'm important too, and I want to be shielded. And from that point on, every patient I give a shield regardless, because it makes them feel better about the exposure. And um, certainly, you know, it, it, it does no harm. You know, so if it does no harm, there's no reason not to use it. So we use shielding for everyone because there is scattered radiation and that sort of thing produced. But spe specifically, you want to make sure that you're shielding patients that are within childbearing age and children. Now, there's three ways that we estimate dose to patients. And um, typically, we're looking at the entrance skin dose. Where the radiation initially hits the patient, this is where the majority of the radiation is absorbed by the patient. So entrance skin dose is always going to be much, much higher than the actual organ dose or the dose to the part of the body that you're exposing. Again, we, so we measure entrance skin dose. We also measure gonadal dose. And I'll show you some charts that gives you an estimate of those. And then we measure bone marrow dose, because bone marrow is where the white blood cells are. And certainly, when it comes to leukemia and damage to the bone marrow, um, we're concerned about that. So those three areas, and usually they will put, if, they're, if you're measuring dose, we can actually put monitors on the patient um, to measure those entrance skin dose and the bone marrow dose. So here's an example of doses. I know everybody's always curious, and it depends upon the system that you're using, of course, but just in general, we can say that these are pretty standardized doses that patients will receive um, given these techniques. So the technique is written here, the KVP. Let's use um, a chest x-ray, for example. I, I talked about this earlier. So here's the KVP, 110 KVP. The mass is three mass. The entrance skin dose in millirincan, this is the exposure coming out of the x-ray tube, is 10. The actual bone marrow, because it has to go through, it's going to hit the skin first. Then the bone marrow would be the ribs and the spine that it's being exposed to. That's about 2 MR for your bone marrow dose. And then, of course, the gonadal dose, Gonads are quite a ways away from the chest. Uh, so that's less than one millirad to the gonads. And this is a chart that's pretty standard. Notice when you get down to CT, these areas, entrance skin dose, much, much higher. Mean um, bone marrow dose is higher. And then, of course, a CT of the pelvis is going to give you a very large gonadal dose because that area is going to be in the primary bead. Okay? Lumbar spine is another one. You know, it's not atypical, uh, the, some of the clinics that I, I work at, that they'll order a six-view lumbar spine on maybe a 30-year-old with back pain. You know, so you're doing an AP, um, both obliques, a cone down upshot of L5-S1, a lateral, and then a cone down lateral of the um, L5-S1 for back pain. Um, it, it results in a pretty high gonadal dose to a young patient. Um, so you have to consider those things. You know, maybe better off getting an AP and lateral, and then if something's wrong, go ahead and order additional films or maybe get an MRI that has no radiation dose exposure with it for the gonadal exposure. So any time that the gonads are in the area of the beam, of course, you're going to have a higher dose. But things like skull x-rays, we hardly ever do those anymore. We used to learn how to do um, skull and mastoids and IACs and all these things. Rarely see skull x-rays anymore. Everybody's getting what? MRI. CT. CT of the sinuses, CT of the head, whatever the reason. Um, another thing we hardly ever do anymore, cross-table lateral C-spine. Used to be trauma units. You go in, shoot a cross-table lateral C-spine, clear them, and you were good to go. Now all of those patients get full CT of the C-spine. Okay, so uh, again, high dose to um, the patient, high dose and uh, gonadal dose is not that high because it's a slip beam. Now, most of you have heard about the FDA warnings recently of overexposure with CT. Um, does anybody know the hospital that got busted for this? It's in California. Cedars, Cedar sinai Hospital. Uh, I'll show you, uh, and these are, these are quote, quotes. Um, this is Medscape. News alert, depending upon the part of the body being scanned, a CT exposes a patient to about 30 to 440 times a chest x-ray for a CT scan. Um, 72 million CT scans are performed a year in the United States. Okay? This is way up from you know, about 16 million 10 years ago. So what does that tell you? People are depending more and more upon these types of tools, upon CT scans, to give them their diagnosis. Now, this is not, these are not my words, so I'm not trying to give scare tax or, 
tactics or anything, but the, this is the article saying that it, about 29,000 to 15,000 um, cancers, excess cancers, as a result of this additional radiation exposure. Most of these cancers are going to be believed to be lung cancers that patients will receive as a result of the exposure to the chest and head. So cedar sinai it was about two years ago, um, was investigated for overexposure of 206 patients over an 18-month period. Remember what I said about digital radiography. CT was one of the very first forms of digital radiography. Those little imaging, the charge couple devices, are along the entire gantry. You have a slit beam and they expose it. Well, if you underexpose, first of all, it's very sensitive to radiation, right? So underexposure is usually not a problem. If you overexpose, is it a problem? No. What does it give you? Just more information. So overexposure is not going to result in a poor scan. If anything, it's going to give you more information, even though you could get the information with even a, a lower exposure. Turns out that you could set the CT scanner. Most of them were preset for a high resolution scan meaning they're going to give you the most information possible. But when you did children and people that were smaller body parts, the technologists were not calibrating the machine or turning it down for these patients, which resulted in overexposure. Um, there was one case of a child who actually got skin burns and epilation. His hair fell out as a result of a tech scanning. It was a, a two-year-old that fell out of a crib or something like that. And they scanned him like four times and ended up with this very, very high dose. So patients are receiving doses anywhere from, you know, three to 400 rads of radiation with these overexposures, um, much, much higher, eight to 10 times the level that would be expected because of the calibration of these machines. Now, California just recently passed a bill that every patient that's scanned now with the CT scanner has to have the dose recorded on their um, paperwork, on their, their uh, requisitions. And if there's an overexposure, it has to be reported to the primary care physician. So have you, any of you heard about this SB bill that was just recently passed? It was just passed two months ago. So it's a, it's a big deal. And we're going to see the hammer coming down on a lot of institutions because this is kind of a, I don't want to say a silent killer, but this is something that's happening that nobody's really aware of. Because x-ray is invisible. It's not like they come out of the scanner glowing, you know, <laughs> that they've had this dose. But it certainly is something you need to be aware of. And companies now that are making scanners are trying to put more um, protection devices on there, safety devices, to prevent overexposure. And I can say as, a, uh, you know, as an educator and as a, a technologist, many times when new graduates get hired, one of the first things that they do so that the student can, uh, so that the, the technologist can take call on things is they'll train them on a CT scanner. So within a month to two months, you know, they learn how to do a head scan or an abdomen scan or something. It's not in-depth two years of training on the CT scanner. It's, you know, the, I don't know if any of you have seen CT scanners now, but basically they're, they're touch, um, you know, uh, panels and you can set them up. The protocols are all built in. And unless you calibrate or change those protocols, it's pretty much, you know, photo timing. So you go in and you can do those scans. So when you have inexperienced technologists doing these sophisticated high exposure exams, it can result, not always does, but can result in overexposure to patients. And they become the victims of um, these problems. So like I said, in some cases, these things were manifest by hair loss and erythema. And as a result, it was found that they were overexposing their patients. So 5% of all radiographic exams today are CT exams, about 72 million per year. It accounts for about 35% when we talked about the amount of exposure that patients get from medical radiography. A third of that is coming from CT scanning, okay, very high dose. Three to five rads for a head scan, that's 3,000 to 5,000 millirads, okay. We talked about a chest x-ray, which is 10 millirads, okay, much, much higher dose. If you're doing imaging scanning and now we have spiral scanning, right, that scans throughout the entire body. You're talking to, we used to do maybe, you know, 20 scans of the abdomen. Now we get 60 scans, and we do it with and without contrast. So again, much higher doses to patients as a result of these high um, sequencing scanners. Okay, and if you're on high resolution, that will result as, as opposed to low resolution in a higher patient dose. But these are protocols that have to be built into the machine. Now, when you talk about a CT scan, this is of a pelvis. We said uh, the chart I gave you a second ago said 3,000 rads for a pelvis, somewhere between two to 4,000 rads, typically for a pelvis. That's your entrance skin dose, but the actual 
effective dose, that that's being absorbed by the organs themselves, you know, the, um, the rectum, uh, the, the, the sigmoid, the ovaries, those parts of the body, is less than that because it's inside the body. And the, again, the greater amount is absorbed by the skin. So about 740 millirem or millirads to the actual organs and a higher dose, of course, to the skin outside, which is more tolerant, of course, of the, than the organs are. Now, if you're standing in a CT scanner, the ISO exposure curves coming out of the scanner are usually very low because the CT scanner has a slit. It's slit scanography, so the, the beam is coming out in a very narrow slit. It's not like an x-ray where the x-ray is coming out in all directions. So if a parent is standing in the room or you're a technologist in this area, the, I know these numbers are really small, so it's hard for you to see, but actually the, the exposures coming out of the gantry itself are very, very low. So you sometimes will see you know, parents and different people standing out into the room because it is a low exposure rate. The other area of concern, of course, um, and many women will not have a mammogram because they're so concerned about the dose um, to the breast tissue. They're afraid they're going to get cancer as a result of the x-ray exposure. In reality, the dose to the breast is much, much lower than it used to be. Women used to get about one rad, 1,000 millirem per exposure. That's been greatly reduced, um, even though this says 1,800, I mean, sorry, 800 uh, millirinkin per view. That's your skin dose. It's not the actual dose to the tissue itself. The tissue dose is about 120. Again, with um, MQSA, which was a bill passed by Congress for uh, uh, Mammography Quality Safety Act that was passed back in 1992, women protested, went to Washington and said, you know, we want uniform quality mammograms done so that the diagnosis is not missed and we're not dying of breast cancer as a result of having our mammograms every year and it's not um, being detected. Well, mammography is, is fairly good. It's a good means of screening patients. It doesn't prevent breast cancer. The whole idea about screening mammography is to prevent, uh, is to get early detection and then prevent death from breast cancer so that you catch it at an early stage. But not all breast cancer is visible on mammography. Okay, um, what is a type of breast cancer that's not particularly visible on mammography? Um, most breast cancer is introductal. introductal, okay, but lobular breast cancer may not calcify. So a woman can feel a mass, they do a mammogram and it looks fine, but they've got lobular ductular cancers, lobular cancer, uh, rather than introductular. So the, the dose now with digital mammography has been greatly reduced. Um, this is showing you the, this is, with a screening mammogram, we take two views, a cranial caudad and a medial lateral. So on your CC view, about 800 millirads of intrinsic skin exposure, but the actual dose to the glandular tissue is about 120 millirads. So that's what? That's about 12 chest x-rays in relationship. Now, why is the dose so high? We referred to this earlier. We use very low KVP, so there's more absorption of the radiation in the tissue, and we use a low, low KVP and high mass so that we get the contrast of a part of the body that has very low subject contrast. So we're trying to enhance the contrast and increase the differential, diagnose, differential absorption. So the total dose to each breast that you're getting in a typical mammogram, if they're not doing mag views and all of that other stuff, is two, about 240 millirad. If a woman gets a mammogram every year of her life, the, it increases her risk of breast cancer by about 0.07%. Now, when there's an overall rate of breast cancer in the United States, about 7% of women will develop breast cancer. It's increasing her risk of breast cancer by less than 1%. Okay? Well, more than 7%. Let's see. If you live to be 85 years old, if I live to be 85 years old, what's my greatest risk of breast cancer as I get older? If I say one in eight women develop breast cancer, they're not 40-year-old women developing breast cancer, although breast cancer is the number one cause of women in their 40s. So women should be screened for breast cancer, but when you get up into the, you know, but not one in eight 40-year-old women is dying of breast cancer or getting breast cancer. It's usually like one in 200 at that age group. So as you increase each decade of life, your chance of developing breast cancer becomes greater, as is any type of cancer, right? Age is the biggest risk factor, age and being female. Men get breast cancer too, but it's only 1%. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> we, it, we all got to go with something, right? <laughs> Okay, so this is showing you the resolution of digital mammography versus film screen mammography. And again, the, that study that I was telling you about, DEMA's study, uh, that was completed in 2005, uh, certainly confirmed that digital mammography was a better means of diagnosing breast cancer in women that have dense breasts, women in the, that age group, 40, 30, 40 years old that have a higher incidence of death from breast cancer, certainly the digital mammography is a better means of diagnosis as, compa as compared to film screen. And not because it has higher resolution, higher spatial resolution, but because it has higher contrast resolution and post-processing enhancement. So they can look at those mammograms, they can magnify them without going back and doing repeat exams and mag views. What about fluoroscopy examinations? How much radiation are we typically giving a patient for a fluoroscopic examination? Well, fluoroscopy can result in a very high dose in a short period of time if you're exposing them. We said that the average exposure per um, minute for a fluoroscopic exam is between 3 and 5 R. That's 3,000 to 5,000 milli R, milli Rinkin. Okay, so that's like a CT scan of the pelvis that we were just talking about, right? if you're using a full, um, uh, full field imaging. So the entrance skin exposure for average adult is between 3 to 5 R per minute, but you can go as high as 10 R per minute. That's the limit on most machines. And if you go into the boost position, this is the high level fluoroscopy for hypersthenic patients, then it can be as high as 20 R per minute. Before 1974, it was unlimited. In 1974, the FDA came out with a report that patients were getting burnt by fluoroscopes, so they limited it to 40 R per minute, 40. Two years later, people were still getting burnt. They limited it again to 20 R per minute, okay, which it's been at ever since. So 20 R per minute for high-level fluoroscopy. But again, if you're using high-level fluoroscopy, be aware you're really in a, in a danger area of causing harm to the patient. You need to make sure that you're moving that beam around and not exposing the same area for long periods of time. <coughs> Some interventional procedures, you can get skin doses up to 100, um, Brad. This is usually during filming. When you do cinefluorography and you're making rapid serial exposures, you can do, you know, most of the time they're exposing about 30 frames per second is a typical exposure rate, but you can expose in children, you can expose up to 150 frames per second where you're exposing cine film, okay, taking images. You've all watched in Grand Rounds or whatever, you've watched um, cardiac casts done and they have the little projector with the film spools that they put on and play and I mean most of it's digital now, but the old cine recorders, all of you seen? Okay, so each one of those images, cine means motion, because the heart beats so fast and your filling vessels are watching the ejection fracture or whatever of a, a heart, watching the valves work, they have to capture it very quickly. So they, they have, um, the fluoroscopy machines can record as fast as 150 frames per second. Well, each one of those frames has an exposure rate with it. And when you're recording images, because you're exposing film, the dose goes up as compared to just making an image on the monitor. So you can get very high dose levels in cinefluorography as compared to static imaging or just routine fluoroscopy where you're stepping on a pedal. Okay, so average patient dose is about 4 R per minute. That's 4,000 MR per minute, which is much higher than we're allowed, you know, to get on a regular basis, right? Um, does anybody know what your your maximum permissible dose or your dose limit is per year if you're occupationally exposed? 5R or 5 rim, right, which is 5,000 millirim. What do you think the average exposure is to somebody that works in x ray? Somebody who's occupationally exposed? Average. Majority of people get under 100 MR, 100 MR per year, 70 MR per year, usually, or less. 53% it's undetectable, the amount of radiation that they get. Now, there's a little caveat to that that we'll talk about, but I have a theory on why that's true. <clears throat> but here, comparing digital to conventional fluoroscopy, let's look at some dose rates. Five minutes of fluoro using the conventional, which remember, conventional has three-phase, six-pulse radiation, 360 pulses per second that the patient's receiving, as opposed to, remember, with digital, 
They're only being exposed for 100 milliseconds per second, so a tenth of the exposure basically, but higher mass because of the system that you're able to use. So conventional low mass but rapid exposure and then with the, with the digital, you have a higher mass but shorter exposure times. So with five minutes of fluoro for conventional, we're talking about 20 rads. That's four times the amount I can get per year, which if you find somebody in radiology who's got five rads a year, I want to meet them. <laughs> I want to talk to them and see what they're doing because nobody gets those, those kinds of doses. Everybody's well, even lifetime is below five rads per year. But you can give a patient uh, about 20 rads in five minutes. With digital, that's about half the amount of radiation. So there is benefit in using the um, pulse uh, fluoro. Spot films. We do take spot films, and this is making recording the images uh, on a digital spot film or with uh, the old fashioned film that I was just talking about. Okay, about six rads for three spot films. That's reduced, again, about a third, two rads with digital spot filming. Okay, and if you're using the mag mode, you magnify something. When you magnify something, because of the geometric factors involved with the image intensifier, basically when you magnify, the dose is going to go up. Your minification gain that we talked about, nine inches down to one inch, that becomes less, so the brightness goes down and the dose goes up to, to compensate for that, is why mag mode causes a higher dose rate. So usually if you go from a nine inch to a six inch mode, your dose is going to double to the patient. You go from a nine to a four inch mode, the dose will be four times the amount to the patient when you magnify the image. So mag mode here, one film, okay, look at this, it's ba basically going to double what you're getting with your three films here, about one rad and with the, uh, or three films here with mag mode, about double the dose and then uh, here you're also getting just a little bit more dose with the conventional digital. So if we looked at the conventional giving all these factors, we're giving the patient about 21 rads in this period of time for recording an image, viewing the image and recording it, whereas the digital, about half the amount of radiation. So digital fluoroscopy does offer a reduction in patient dose without losing any of the quality or the resolution of your imaging. So this is a C-arm, and it's called a C-arm because there is a device, this metal arm, that keeps the fluoroscopy tube in direct alignment with the image intensifying tube. So we can't point this tube at anything other than the image intensifier tube. Whenever we point an x-ray tube at something, whatever it's being pointed at is called the primary barrier. Okay? On the California State exam, they ask you, what's the primary barrier for an image intensifier? And a lot of people answer, the patient. <laughs> well, the patient, a primary barrier is a protection device. It's not the patient. They're not protecting you. Uh, it, this uh, fluoroscopy tube is always pointed at the image intensifier tube here. And the way that you want to align this when you're working with it is you want to keep the image intensifier under the table or where the table would be if you had one because when the radiation hits the tabletop, it's going to do what? When it hits anything, what does it do? It scatters. It scatters. And it's going to scatter at high KVP, it's going to backscatter. It's going to go back in the direction that it came from. At low KVP, it tends to forward scatter. Okay, so at higher KVPs, it's going to backscatter, and it's better for this radiation to be going down toward the floor than up in the OR room or up in the um, x-ray room where everybody's standing so that their eyes, the lens of the eyes are susceptible to radiation. You can get cataracts even from environmental exposure. And of course, your thyroid is sensitive to radiation. So those are the two organs we're most concerned about in the uh, head and neck area. And for women, the breasts are sensitive to radiation, so we always want to keep, limit the amount of radiation to the breast. I mean, if you have an apron on and you're leaning over the table and your apron's hanging down because it's loose and you're getting exposure to your breast, that's not a good thing. Uh, thyroid shields are recommended if you're exposing, you know, if you're in the OR in different places, you should wear thyroid shields to protect your thyroid, especially if you're a woman because women get more thyroid disease than men. It's, the incidence of thyroid disease in women is four times that of men. So it's better to protect yourself, better safe than sorry. So you want to orient yourself so that the x-ray tube, which is located here, is under the patient, and the II tube, which is located up here, is above the patient. The II tube is also lined with lead, so it protects you. The beam cannot be, by law, it can't be any bigger 
than the input phosphor. So it has to be collimated automatically so that it is the size or smaller than the input phosphor. And this is to protect you so the, from the scattered radiation. And then in addition, the housing of the image intensifier, intensifier will also absorb the secondary radiation being produced. Now does anybody know what this little thing is right here? Here's the x-ray tube. What's this? Collimator. Collimator, no. The collimator's in there, though. It's a spacer. Right, it's a spacer. <laughs> By law, you cannot have this x-ray tube any closer, any x-ray tube, not just a fluoro tube, whether you're dealing with a regular stationary x-ray tube or a portable machine that we take up to the floors to x-ray patients, no x-ray tube is allowed to be any closer to the patient than 12 inches or 30 centimeters. Why? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is that radiation comes out of this tube head in all directions. Remember, x-rays are very small, right? Size of electrons. So if there's a seal on the housing, the x-rays can leak through the housing seal. You have to be able to get the x-ray tubes out of there when they burn out and replace them and put them in. So this is not um, hermetically sealed so that nothing can go through it. So you're allowed to have a certain amount of radiation that come out of the x-ray tube. It also scatters when it hits these collimators and different things. It's interacting. The x-ray beam is hitting all of this stuff and scattering. So there's a lot of scattered radiation produced around the head of the x-ray tube. So the x-ray tube, if you have to stand some, next to something, it, you don't want it to be the x-ray tube itself. The portable units that we use up on the floors, like if you order a portable chest x-ray on somebody, all of those units come with six-foot cords so that we can get away from the x-ray tube. Okay, we don't want to be standing next to that when we make an exposure. You're only producing that scattered and leakage radiation while you're making the exposure. It doesn't like leak out of the tube. There's no radioactive you know, element. There's no cobalt or anything inside of the x-ray tube. It's man-made. You're only producing x-rays when you're pushing a button and making the exposure. Nat, you used to be an ER physician. What happened when people would yell x-ray in the ER? Scattered. Yes, yeah, like turning on the light, you know, at night. Everybody runs and hides. You know, you tell the patient, uh, you know, that there's nothing wrong with the x-ray. You're perfectly safe. And then you yell x-ray and everybody runs. And the pa poor patient's sitting there going, oh, my God, what's going to happen to me? I had a student one time and they didn't want to wear the lead apron. You're supposed to wear a lead apron whenever you take portables. Well, they thought it was a nuisance. So they said, well, you know, we have a film bin in the portable and, and the film bin's lead lined. What if I just drop down behind the film bin when I make my exposure? So he wanted to yell x-ray and then to the patient, okay, take a deep breath and hold it and then drop to the floor <laughs> in front of the patient. I said, it's bad enough that the, the nurses all run, but if they see you drop, you know, like you do under the table when there's an earthquake, when you're taking an x-ray, it's not gonna instill much confidence in the patient that what you're doing to them is not harmful. In addition, it's not a very effective way because x-ray bounces, it scatters. It's like, you know, firing a, uh, a machine gun. You know, if you're firing a machine gun in a room, in a closed room, would you want to just duck behind something rather than get out of the room? No, because it can bounce around. So it's not an effective way, but again, it doesn't instill much confidence. All right, what about source skin distance and object image distance? Now, this setup with the C-arm is a very poor radiation safety demonstration. Who can tell me what's wrong with it? Why would you not want your C-arm set up like this? Well, the image intensifier is above the patient. That's good, right? We want that to happen. Okay, we didn't talk much about uh, the divergence of the X-ray beam, but this image intensifier, think about it as the image receptor, the film. Would you take an X-ray of a patient with the hand here and the film here? Would you? Why not? It magnifies it, so you're gonna get poor quality. But what else? If I take a magnification view, let's say I go get a mammogram, and they need to do a mag view, they have a spacer, the film's here, the breast is here. And then they make an exposure. They take the grid away. You don't need the grid because something's gonna happen as you expose. All the scattered radiation will be absorbed in the air, so you don't need the grid. But if I expose the breast way up here, the radiation has to come from the breast and go all the way down to the film something called the inverse square law. The intensity of the x-ray, the number of photons actually traveling from the breast down to the film are gonna be decreased by the square of the distance. So if I have 100 photons coming out and it's four inches away, only 25 of them are gonna get to the image. The rest of them are gonna be diverged, spread out, and miss the film, or they're gonna be absorbed by the air. So the closer you have the part to your image receptor, 
the better the resolution is going to be and the lower the dose to the patient because all of the x-rays, the remnant radiation coming from the part is going to end up on the receptor. Well, how far away is the receptor in this incident, in this example? It's way up here. So not, look how big that lumbar spine is. Can you, can you all see that? It's kind of small, but the lumbar spine is basically filling the entire screen. So it's magnified, but the patient is getting four times the dose because remember we talked about automatic brightness stabilizer or automatic brightness control? That's measuring the amount of radiation being produced in hitting the input phosphor and the light being produced at the output phosphor. So since only a fourth of the radiation is going to reach this image intensifier, I got to put four times more in to the patient. Not only that, but with the C arm, the x ray tube and the image intensifier move in tandem, don't they? So if I move the x ray tube closer to the patient, the image intensifier automatically is going to do what? It's move further away. If I move the image intensifier closer to the patient, what happens to the x ray tube? Automatically moves further away. So in this case, they've got that x-ray tube right up against the table base. So that spacer is sitting right here, and the image intensifier is really far away. So not only is the beam closer to the patient, they're getting more scattered radiation coming off of the beam. They're getting leakage radiation. But in addition, the machine has to boost the technique to get the same image on the monitor because you're losing all of the remnant radiation, which is lower energy, to that air gap. Okay. So you want to have the beam collimated as tightly as possible and move the image intensifier as close to the patient as possible. You want the patient as far away from the x-ray tube as possible, okay? Now this is only possible to change these distances when you're working with a C-arm. If you're working with a stationary unit, the x-ray tube is fixed in the table base. The only thing I can do that's going to harm the patient is move my tower up. If you move the tower up higher, the patient's going to get more radiation. If you move it down lower, they're going to get more radiation. But the radiation is going to be coming from that automatic brightness control. You won't have that second component, meaning the x-ray tube is actually closer to the patient, exposing them to higher doses. You follow me? So you're still going to increase the dose to a patient if you move the tower farther away from the patient, but not fourfold like you would by moving the x-ray tube closer to the patient plus the tower further away because they're moving together. So in mobile radiography, one of the main reasons in California they make people, they make technologists even get fluoroscopy permits is so that when they set up the C-arm in the OR, when they set up the C-arm in the cath labs and that sort of thing, that they're setting them up correctly so that you're getting a minimal exposure not only to the patient but to everybody in the room. Okay, so if you're sitting in this room and this tube's way up here, where's all, this, where's all the radiation from the patient going? Is it being captured by the image intensifier? No. It's scattering all over the room to the people standing there. Okay, so when you reduce the dose to your patients, you're also going to be reducing your dose to yourself. Your dose is directly proportional to your patient's dose. It's not equal. I mean, if you're giving your patient 100 rads a minute, you're not giving yourself that amount. You're getting a, a, you know, a percentage of that. But if you give them 25 rads per minute, you're going to get a, a lot less, the same percentage reduction to yourself. So it behooves you to, to practice really good radiation safety for your patients and thereby reduce the dose to yourself. Now the other thing that we uh, use for patients is gonadal shielding. And if you're doing uh, you know, procedures, you can take the time to shield your patients. Like I said, there's, uh, there's different types of shields and I like to shield everybody regardless, but this is called a flat contact shield. It's basically a piece of lead like an apron or whatever that you can place over the patient if they're lying down on their back or on their stomach. If you've got the x-ray beam below the table, then the shield should be on the tabletop, not on the top of the patient. Because if the x-ray goes through the patient, it's going to hit the shield and then backscatter to the patient. So this is really improper placement. Well, you can see that the the fluoro tower is not in place, so this is, you know, they're probably having a knee x-ray or something. But if I was actually doing fluoroscopy, I'd want to put the lead shield on the tabletop where the x-ray beam is. You want it to be in the same path that the x-ray beam is coming from, not the image intensifier. Does that make sense to do it that way? Okay, so, and this is called a shadow shield. We use this when we go into the OR and also on portables, and it's uh, a piece of lead shape of a triangle that we put in the direct path of the x-ray beam so that that portion of the beam is filtered away from the patient's gonads. 
So if you're in a sterile field, or let's say you're in the NICU with children, you don't want to bring a, you know, lead, a lead shield from your department that's been contaminated and place it on them. You can use this shadow shield and you don't have to worry about contamination. And then this is a shaped contact shield. You don't see these much anymore, but we used to use them when, when we did a lot of fluoroscopy. It's for male patients only, and they're put in a jock strap and the patient puts them on. Like I said, there's never a time when we really need to see the scrotum. So they can wear this, and of course it has to be in a, in a, in a holder. You can't tape them on the patient. Uh, they don't like that. Uh, but put them in a holder and then have the patient put it on in the dressing room, and then afterwards you know, they dispose of it. Don't dispose of the shield, but of the holder. Okay, oh, we're doing really good on time. All right, again, a lot of information about protection. We're going to talk about more in detail about protection for you in a second, but are there any questions about the information that I just talked about? Patient protection. Yes? Part of the one, you use the arms in operating, you have a you know, standard seat with your collimator with your intensifier with the actual x-ray beam that you, you can't get it short. You can't get it longer so that either, like you were saying, it either goes up or goes down, so right. it doesn't matter. You're still going to not really make a big change, uh, like when we're operating on the fracture tables, that it's not going to, uh, there's a certain model room that you can't right. adjust. And part of it has to do with the height of the table as well. So if you have an operating table that's low to the ground, you're not going to have a lot of flexibility as far as how far you can put that beam down. If you have a higher table, um, and the table should be radiolucent as well. It should be a, a fluoroscopy table, not just a standard OR table. I think most of them are radiolucent, made out of carbon, whatever. But the higher the table is, the more um, room you have to bring that CR on down. But if you're limited in how much you can move it, make sure that it's down as far as possible, which is going to put your eye tube as close to the patient. Of course, the other thing you have to be concerned about is your sterile field, right? But the, the C arm should be draped, you know, with plastic sterile um, drapes and that sort of thing. But you're really limited. What you can do, and the tech can do, is you don't need to see that full round screen. You can always collimate the beam in closer. And the more you collimate, the better the image quality is going to be as a result. I think obesity also is changing the entire landscape. I yes. know that I've had patients, so I don't have very much room to do anything, but they barely fit in. Don't hit the needle. On on the actual right. Sterile. Just let me give you a tip about obese patients. The tendency with obese patients uh, is to open your collimators because you think, oh, I've got all this area and I can't find anything. What you're going to find is um, scattered radiation. There's two factors. It has to do with how thick the part is, right? The thicker the part and the more that you collimate. So the thicker the part is, regardless of the KVP that you have, the more tissue there is for the x-ray to interact with. So thin patients will always give you nice contrasty images. Thick patients, almost no matter what you do, you're not going to get a, a, a bright contrasty image. But if you collimate as tightly as possible, rather than leave your collimators open, you're going to get a much sharper image because you're going to reduce the number of photons that are interacting with the patient and you're going to get a sharper image as a result of it. So your film, will, your image will be more contrasty, it will be sharper, you know, I didn't bring it, but I do have a slide showing two lumbar spines, one with the beam open and one collimated. And the difference in the resolution is, is incredible. He'd be proud of Dr. Prevo. He always does that. <laughs> yeah. Good operators will cone down just to the area that they're interested on, and then, you know, you can see it much, much better if you cone down because you're eliminating the scattered radiation and improving the quality of the image. Any other questions? Yes. This is very, very practical, but. On our vans, the knob we're turning is actually the KVP. Right. So right. actually, what I'm hearing is that turning it up is going to reduce the patient's MAS, which is actually going to reduce the radiation exposure. Is yes. that correct? Yes. Yep. That's why we use high KVP. We use high KVP with yeah. fluoroscopy. Yeah. Now, the only difference you're going to see, if you're using barium, which is a contrast agent, you're not going to see a big difference in your contrast because you're already giving the patient something that's going to absorb. Um, if you were doing soft tissue like lumbar spine or something like that and trying to you know, do a, a needle placement, then you may want to turn your KVP down because you're going to gray out the bone. But um, you know, with barium situation, yeah, higher KVP, lower mass, lower patient dose, but a little bit more scattered. So just be careful of the scattered radiation.